Why America Must Return to Gold Coinage Circulation in 2013 A Position Paper by Jonathan Barlow Gee on behalf of the Pythagorean Order of Death Aloha In this exposition I propose to expound upon an important issue for all of us alive at this time. The fact stands bold and should not now nor ever again be understated. America needs a gold currency. Why? The Liberty Bell tolls the eternal question whose answer is the retreating horizon line itself blurring off into the sky above. Why does America need a gold currency? Why was it written into the Constitution by the nation's founding fathers that, quote, no state shall make any thing but gold and silver coin a tender in payment of debts. The U.S. Constitution, Section 10, Limits on States, Clause 1, Contracts Clause. End quote. Why was it important for fiat counterfeiters to force legislation? to circumvent private ownership of gold by U.S. citizens in order to begin spiraling up the modern quantity of debt. What is debt? If all U.S. tax revenue is less than even the interest owed by the U.S. government to the Federal Reserve private bank per annum, and if the entire U.S. GDP was surpassed by the government debt ceiling in predicted expenditures, as it recently was, followed by the Federal Reserve implementing quantitative easing. Then what does the debt amount to, aside from the obvious fact of it, which the U.S. government in Washington, D.C. remains too blithe to admit? Bankruptcy. So if a private U.S. bank is owed any sum X amount of fiat currency, it, that is, the nation, and thus, by taxation, we, its citizens, must pay it back in gold. That is the law. However, if the law impedes progress, why not change it? Why not just say, we owe the bank too much? We can, and so should, must, and will just repossess the bank, thus acquiring all its holdings. In truth, there's nothing preventing it from working just that way. The IRS can exercise a more thorough audit of the Fed than the GAO, and the Fed's long-standing criminal dealings will be aired eventually one way or another, since everyone already knows they funded all the secret wars of the 20th and thus far early 21st century. So why not just muscle them under by swaying popular sentiment toward looting the banks? Well, for one thing, it would work in the short term, but cause a credit bubble and crunch larger than even the currency bubble backed by the USD as the WRC right now. And this might very well be a natural result that would need to occur at some point along the line if one were to take this route. But there's a much simpler resolution to this current currency and any potential future credit crisis look at what the current laws are on the books for such a situation, and attempt to follow the advice of our forefathers who fought and died for our right to learn from their mistakes. To throw away our responsibility to study their legal contributions to it is to forget our own whole history. In this case, we have the proposition of forcing the U.S. government to declare bankruptcy. However, this is a lengthy and long terminology legal proposition with little hope of either solving the problem in time nor of addressing the real culprits behind the debt crises. So we are left only with the third alternative to study the precedent for the modern conceptual bankruptcy laws and how they could be applied to the U.S. government itself, and that is set in 10 one of the U.S. Constitution, where it discusses legal tender laws. If you take out a debt, the debt can be paper, because the paper is only a token of exchange, symbolizing an IOU, 
whereby you essentially lease the money from a creditor, preferably interest-free. But if you owe a debt, you have to repay the debt in U.S. constitutionally legal tender, i.e. gold. So if the U.S. government tanks to the Fed private bank, then those who allowed the easy money high spending of the U.S. government in the first place prosper at the expense of the taxpayer. They traded us credit on loan with high interest rates, and we now have to pay them back in solid gold, just because it's the law. So ultimately, both options seem doomed. Either we repo the banks with a run on the dollar, resulting in hyperinflation of prices, or alternately, we knuckle under to the private banking cartel, pay them their gold, or risk becoming their slaves. So naturally, both these premises appear morally repugnant, despite that either would save us from the worst risk we actually will face if we ignore either choice, that of hyperinflation occurring despite temporary postponements. So if we are facing a more or less certain doom scenario in our current economic situation, where both our only apparent options are lose-lose situations for us all, then the question's importance is accentuated to the nth. What is the economy? How can we control it? How can we all benefit from it? And how can we avoid the seemingly inevitable consequences of the crisis we've already gotten ourselves into today? I propose to address these issues now. Why gold coinage? There are those in the U.S. government now, post 9-11, who claim the Constitution is no longer relevant. However, we must learn as much as we can from any and all our past mistakes. So, if the Constitution was wrong, it stands to reason we can learn how to correct or improve it only by beginning with the document itself as the basis. Now, assuming the fact the framers stipulated gold coinage as the only legal tender of the U.S., we can argue their case relative to what we have today from several angles. 1. Were the framers aware of the possible use of paper money? Yes, and they believed usury and counterfeiting were treasons punishable by a federal death sentence. They were opposed to a central bank for that very reason. 2. Why can only gold be used as legal tender in the U.S.? Because the USD was originally defined as being tied to a certain weight of gold. Naturally, now that gold is only seen as a commodity and not used solely as the method of exchange, the values of gold in dollars and of dollars in gold fluctuate. However, prior to the 1970s, the USD was backed by a weight of gold. This gold is the value of money, and not the paper itself. The paper was originally intended to only be used as an IOU receipt, or a bill of sale. Thus, according to the laws of the U.S. Constitution, no state can counterfeit bills and call it money if it has no backing by a solid value. In theory, one can substitute any commodity for the value of money, so long as money is only seen as on loan in exchange for a solid commodity collateral. You can then trade the quote-unquote money without loss to the collateral. That is, of course, the cause of our present problems. Without use of the solid material commodity as the monetary exchange unit itself, no other solid material commodity can be substituted equally effectively for it as the unit of exchange. In short, if gold is solely the collateral commodity, any other good traded instead of gold would be worth zero in comparison to it. The argument is occasionally made, for example, to base our economy on oil, not gold. This would, aside from raising all prices at the rate gas prices increase now, prove the same mistake as our basing it on paper. Substituting anything for something else, 
saying something is worth any value x in terms of any other commodity or service depends on the value of the other thing that is substituted for. Something that symbolizes value can have no other intrinsic value in itself. Gold can be used as an exchange unit symbolizing any value. Other than this, gold is a useless commodity. 3. Is there enough gold? A common argument made now against returning to use of gold coins is that there simply isn't enough gold. This depends on the rate of exchange to currency. For example, if the USD does result in hyperinflation of staple prices, then a loaf of bread would cost X amount in USD and only Y amount in gold where X is greater than Y. The moral of this is that if the USD hyperinflates, gold would not, except in relation to the USD. So this sounds like a good argument to substitute gold for the USD prior to the USD possibly hyperinflating staple prices. It is. It's also a better argument for the US to be the nation that sets the trend for this activity for other nations, for us to lead by example. The notion of there not being enough gold falls apart only if we wanted to implement a gold coin as a global currency instantly, and then only because of the different values of national currencies in their international exchange rates. If the nation of the US, and only the US, wanted to implement a gold coin as a national currency instantly, then there would technically be a surplus of gold. Let's say, for example, the USD began to hyperinflate staple prices tomorrow. We would want to use it to buy back our gold holdings from China, who purchased them from the Fed. We would, if in hyperinflation, be able to purchase back less gold, but this gold would still be equal to a larger amount of food. Essentially, even hyperinflation is not an insurmountable problem if we eventually do resort to use of gold as the monetary exchange unit. Obviously, the sooner the better, and that is why I'm drafting this position paper now in 2012. So let's say that the U.S. government has X amount of USD with which to purchase Y amount of gold, where the numerical sums measuring X are long and the sum of the weight of the gold commodity very small in comparison. Almost any sky-high sum of X to buy any infinitesimally small sum of Y is better than none. But the sooner we can implement this action, the better as well. But let's say that the U.S. government has Y amount of gold to translate into Z amount of food, and that the loss of apparent revenue in terms of the large sum X of USD for the small sum Y of gold has been overcome. Y gold buys Z food, regardless of the apparent cost of Z in terms of X. So let's say that the U.S. has Y amount of gold, and the world has Z quantity of food. The U.S. then budgets and trades out its Y amount of gold to the rest of the world in exchange for their imports to the U.S. of Z sum of food and other staple goods. The U.S. leads by example in this regard because the USD is still capable right now of buying back more gold at its current rate than any other national or regional currency alone. The U.S. would seem to be hoarding gold in this action but would in reality be leading by example by then gradually retrading its gold to a more balanced global market in exchange for better budgeted goods and only necessary services. The problem is not that there is not enough gold to perform such an action. The problem is that there could be too little for us to even buy food with a hyperinflated valueless dollar if we wait too long before we do so. The amount Y of gold we would hold would then set the baseline tone for the amount of per capita national holdings in a global gold coin economy. However, the amount of gold